Idaho school levy special elections coming up tomorrow. We'll break down everything you need to know and what to expect. Compared to this same time last year, we've had almost four times as many shootings and drive-bys than we did than we did last year. Plus, gang violence on the rise in Spokane County. What authorities say need to happen to bring that number down? We're still tracking some light rain and snow showers for the first half of this week as temperatures stay pretty average for the month of March. A new milestone reached today in the coronavirus pandemic. Washington has administered more than 2 million doses of the coronavirus vaccine since it became available in mid-December. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm Regina on. Well, the good news comes on the heels of highly anticipated guidelines from the CDC that breaks down what vaccinated people should or should not do. So here are three things you should know. If you're fully vaccinated, you now can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household if it fits with people who may be at high risk for COVID-19 you should still take those preventative measures otherwise you don't have to mask up you also won't have to quarantine after a known exposure as long as you have no symptoms but what does it mean to be fully vaccinated for those who took the Moderna or Pfizer's two dose re regimen? It takes about two weeks after the second shot to be fully considered fully vaccinated. Johnson and Johnson's one dose vaccine protection is considered full two weeks after that single shot. But until then, you should still take all of those prevention steps to keep yourself and other people safe. I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that we weren't sicker when we had the virus, and I'm grateful that the vaccines are available for people. And with the new guidelines, people who have been fully vaccinated are thankful. We spoke with Cheryl Cooney today, who said she's ready to get one step closer to normalcy. More than 60 million Americans have gotten at least one vaccine dose, and now the new guidance gives us our first glimpse of a possible post-pandemic future. New tonight, a man convicted of killing a Coeur d'Alene family 16 years ago will likely die in prison before his death sentence can be carried out. According to court documents, Joseph Duncan has terminal brain cancer as he sits on death row. Duncan was convicted of killing four members of a family in Coeur d'Alene back in 2005. He kidnapped two children, Dylan and Shasta Grown, from the family's home and tortured them in Montana. Shasta, the only survivor of the rampage, she was rescued after Duncan stopped at a Denny's in Coeur d'Alene when she was recognized by a staff member there. Duncan has been on federal death row in Indiana for years as his appeals move forward. A North Idaho sex offender on the run for more than 20 years was finally caught in Florida last week. 75 year old Philip Jennison was on the run from police more than two decades until U.S. Marshals caught him on Friday. Jennison was convicted for molestation in 1995 and was required to register as a sex offender upon his release from prison, which he did not. According to the U.S. Marshals Service, Jennison, who was Idaho's longest escaped sex offender, he is now being extra added back to Idaho. 42 superintendents of public, private and charter schools from across Washington signed a letter asking for state leaders to consider flexibility and social distancing in schools. In that letter, they say, quote, in order for many of us to be able to bring all of our students who want to come back to in-person schooling and not relegate some to continued remote learning, strict adherence to six feet of physical distance has to be desired and that outcome physically impossible. Tomorrow, we're speaking with the ESC superintendent Michael done on why school leaders are pushing for this move. There is a special election in Idaho tomorrow among the items on the ballot, a levy for the Coeur d'Alene Public Schools. Tonight, our political reporter Casey Decker spoke with supporters and opponents of that levy. The district is asking for $20 million per year, the same as it currently gets under the expiring levy. But since the population inside the district has gone up, the individual property tax rate under this proposal would actually be lower than it currently is. The 20 million helps fund nearly every aspect of the school system. It's 25% of the operating budget. So um, it's a it would be a really big deal if it didn't pass. It would be pretty devastating to our kids, to our teachers. Supporters of the levy, like Tracy Hanks, say the pandemic has made the levy even more important, providing services students desperately need, like counseling and school nurses. 
hmm, that's a pretty critical thing this year. We'd like to keep our school nurses in our schools. But opponents like Jeremy Morris say the pandemic is actually all the more reason to reject the levy right now. I would ask voters tomorrow to just think, should we maybe send a message to the schools that, you know, if, if you need more money, we can do that. But maybe this isn't the right time. Maybe first you should show us some accountability. Many conservatives like Morris feel the district isn't spending the money wisely, and many are also upset with how it's handled reopening. They feel like rejecting the levy would force the district to listen to their concerns. I don't see Republicans out there saying, you know, let's really uh, stick it to them. Let's hurt the schools. I think it's the opposite. It's let's get schools that are, are better performing Morris has in fact recently filed a lawsuit against the district on behalf of a number of local Republicans, though he spoke with Krem in his personal capacity. The suit alleges that during the November election, Republicans handing out flyers near polling places were unfairly kicked off the school grounds in violation of their free expression and of state electioneering laws. Morris generally feels the school board has ignored or shouted down conservative voices and hopes the suit and anti-levy sentiment could change that. But Levy supporters argue that's a dangerous political game. Our most at risk community members and families have suffered greatly and really depend on school. So now is like not the time at all for this to not pass. It's more important than ever. The Levy is up for a vote on Election Day tomorrow. Casey Decker, Krem 2 News. Well, the Gonzaga men's basketball team breezed past St. Mary's tonight, winning 78-55. Brenna Green joining us live now from the newsroom now to talk about another dominant performance for the Zags. Hi, Brenna. Hi, Regina. Yeah, by the way, uh, tonight was their 29th straight win, which times a program record for consecutive wins. Drew Timmy was the star of the show this evening. What's crazy is that it was seven minutes into this game before Drew even scored. His first bucket came on this and one that put Gonzaga up by 11 with 13-20 in the first. Minute and a half later, Drew bullies his way inside. Too easy. Let's try a different scoring option or different way to score, I guess I should say. Can't stop him going downhill either. We're going to show, we're going to stop the buckets for a second to show the sweet pass to Joel Iaii. Temi led the Zags in assists tonight with four. How about another and one with 420 to go? Gonzaga up 14 after that, now off the pick and roll. I think you get the picture here. Drew went seven of eight in the first half for 15 points and ended eight of 11 for 18 points, which led the Zags. He also had a team high eight boards. Temi had a great WCC tournament last year, too. Mark View was effusive on Drew's performance tonight and also had a hilarious soundbite about Drew in Las Vegas overall. I'm on his ass a lot, uh, but uh, I probably don't tell him enough how just how how good he is. But uh, you know, some of us just have that lot in life and that role. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we need to encourage Drew to keep coming down to Vegas. So just for the record, <laughs> why is that? <laughs> I think we both know why. <laughs> Gonzaga will play the winner of BYU and Pepperdine at 6 p.m. tomorrow on ESPN. One more fun fact from tonight. Gonzaga starters shot a combined 62% from the field and combined for 73 of the team's 78 points. Back to you. All right, Brenna, thank you. Okay, turning now to a look at weather. Last week was just picture perfect, wasn't it? And we're hoping to see those spring-like temperatures this week. So let's bring in Thomas Patrick, who's out on the Outdoor Weather Center for us tonight. So Thomas, tell me some good news. Are we going to get those warm temperatures or is it going to get chillier? What are we expecting? You know, <laughs> I, I know you love the sunshine more yes. than anything else. And we will get the sunshine, but it's kind of packed in the back half of the week this time around because what we're seeing right now is this huge low pressure area over the Pacific Ocean. It's actually spitting out some showers mainly along the Oregon and Washington coasts right now. We will look for a few light rain shower chances, mostly rain showers for a couple days. And then once that big system's out of the way, then we'll start pouring on the sunshine and the warmer temperatures. But that comes later on in the week. A few light showers moving through southern Washington as well. So it looks like from Moses Lake down towards Dayton and Pomeroy, probably seeing some light rain as of right now. That could be a few snowflakes again tomorrow morning, but again, nothing 
nothing that sticks unless it's up in the mountains, but uh, a cool morning right around 31 degrees for the low. We still get in the upper 40s for the afternoon, but watching for another chance for those afternoon showers because that system is just so large as it stands right now. Kind of the same thing for the first half of this week, but it does move out of the way. And when we get the other side of that jet stream wave known as the ridge, then we'll start to see the warmer temperatures. I'll show you how close we could get to yet our last week's marks. Remember, we got up to 60 degrees last Friday. I'll show, show you how close we'll get to that later on this week. And of course, how much sunshine we'll get as a result of this weather pattern. I'm crossing my fingers and toes. Yep. <laughs> All right, Thomas, thank you. Well, it is International Women's Day today and coming up after the break, I spoke with a Spokane woman who is excelling in a mostly male dominated field. You want to hear that story coming up after the break.